Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to have so many people uh, attend this uh, Zoom lecture by Daniel Grinberg. My name is Jonathan Brent. I'm executive director of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. YIVO was founded in Vilna, Poland, Berlin and Warsaw in 1925. Our roots in Polish history and culture therefore are at the center of Ivo's history and self-conception, making this award all the more important for us. Endowed by Professor Jan Karski at the Ivo Institute for Jewish Research in 1992, the Jan Karski and Pola Nurenska Award is the joint Ivo Jewish Historical Institute, Jich, award that recognizes authors of published works documenting Polish Jewish relations and Jewish contributions to Polish culture. And as such, this award has international significance. It has been in, in operation for almost 30 years. Yet this is the first time in all those years that an honorary will have spoken at the YIVO Institute, albeit this time electronically. We hope in the future that, uh, that honorees will be able to join us either by Zoom or in fact in person once our offices open again. This prize was the product of a friendship between Dr. Lucien Dobrzycki and Jan Karski. And I was most honored to have met with Professor Karski in Lucien's YIVO office in 1991 when they discussed the details of this prize. The partnership is of utmost importance for YIVO. And in the original spirit of this award, we look forward to continuing our friendship with our Polish colleagues and strengthening our ties and our projects. And before introducing uh, Professor Grinberg, I want to uh, restate uh, what, uh, what, what Alex Weiser uh, said a moment ago, that if you like what we do at Evo, please consider joining as a member, making a donation, or continuing to tune in. Uh, Daniel Grinberg was born March 18th, 1950 in Lodge, and is a Polish historian of Jewish origin. Director of the Jewish Historical Institute from 1990 to 1995, Grinberg is an outstanding expert on the general history of the 19th century and of the anarchist movement in particular. Areas of study include historical sociology, the history of ideas, historiosophy, political emigration, social movements, and the emancipation of European Jews. Rindberg translated into Polish the origins of totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt in 1989, uh, and the theory of democracy uh, in 1994. Since 1991, Rindberg has been a professor at the Institute of History at the University of Bialystok. Today, it is our pleasure to have him give a talk on the picture and price of Jewish assimilation in documentary and feature silent films. Using documentaries and feature silent films, Professor Grinberg analyzes the changing character and perception of Jews in both the United States and Poland in the early 20th century and the price of assimilation for Jewish communities in this period. It is an honor for us to have awarded uh, the uh, Karski Prize uh, this year to Professor Grinberg, and it is a great pleasure to, to uh, 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 let him now give his presentation. Thank you. May I talk? Yes. Thank you very much for your nice words and uh, for your presentation of my uh, person. I just want to say that I knew personally Jan Karski as a director of the Historical Institute in the moment when he made this prize. Uh, and 
I'm so grateful for the uh, continuous work done by Ivo to continue the, uh, all the things started by Dobroszewski and Karski. Well, I would like to start from saying good evening to those of you who live in the United States, North America, or even Argentine, or uh, rather good afternoon to the others who live, uh, unfortunately not in Poland, of course, is <laughs> good evening and good afternoon for, uh, for America. Well, uh, I, you know what is the subject of my story. I will just want one thing to add, but I would like to warn you that my command of English is far from perfect. So please excuse my fault, mistakes, faulty pronunciations, and so on. I still believe you can understand my English. So I'm starting now. Theoretically, assimilation, understood as a long process, or, or as its final result, universally, is a universally accepted and well-developed sociological concept. The seven-stage schema created by Gordon has been applied with great success to a variety of populations. Most scholars divide this process into two phases, differentiating initial changes called acculturation, amalgamation or accommodation, initial adaptation from the true final integration. Important here is the observation that assimilation is made to a social community rather than to a national or cultural community. And even more importantly, not to the general society, but rather to the specific layer of the middle class that is closest to the values and aspirations of the allowed group. The goal of assimilation is fitting in as much as possible, which means the loss of large part of the previous identity. As a result, the group being assimilated into also changes a little. One of the objective measures of the pace of assimilation is the level of mixed marriages between members of the two groups. Americans, as members of the nation of immigrants, treat assimilation very seriously. The Jews have been used as a focus of many theoretical and comparative studies. The concept of melting pot, formulated by Israel Zangwill, or Zangwill as Germans call, it, call him, in 1908, as the title of his play, became a classic and popular interpretative tool. Zangwill was a British Jewish journalist and a writer with the Polish Latin roots. Called, not without reason, the Jewish Deacon. He was the author of the famous Children of the Ghetto, 1892, a Zionist territorialist, a pacifist, and an early spokesman for women's equality. Married into the privileged, well-to-do layers of the English society, he propagated socialism, Serbian style, and universalist solutions, like the League of Nations. Zengvid believed that Judaism is an anachronistic superstition, which obstructs the adaptation of Jews to the requirements of present time. He was ready to sacrifice the cultural luggage in the name of the destruction of the ghetto's walls. In his play, dedicated to President Theodore Roosevelt, he cut ties with those who would like to conform America to Europe. The hero and the author's port parole, violinist David Pixano, earlier a helpless witness of the Kishinev pogrom, upon viewing Ellis Island with its Statue of Liberty, addresses an impassioned tirade in honor of the new world. Germans and Frenchmen, Irishmen and Englishmen, Jews and Russians, all get into the melting pot. God creates Americans. Yes, East and West, and North and South, the palm and the pine, the pole and the equator, the crescent and the cross, how the great alchemist melts and fuses them with his perishing flame. Here shall they all unite to build the Republic of Man and the Kingdom of God. Under the impression of the new homeland, 
David composes a magnificent symphony, and his prize for abandonment of tribal animosity is the love of Viera, a daughter of a baron officer who has persecuted in Russia his family. The idea of melting pot, as taken up by scholars, became the dominating theoretical concept for considering assimilation during the first decades of the new century. Displacing Anglo-Saxon exclusively was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, offering full social recognition only for selected candidates. For many East European Jews, running away from pogroms, the necessity of denying one's identity was not viewed as something particularly painful. When I put my foot down on American soil, I was like a newborn, recalls Adolf Zucker, who had come from Hungary. Another Hollywood tycoon, Louis B. Meyer, born in Minsk, when filling out his naturalization papers, patriotically marked the 4th of July as his date of birth. One of the first American Jewish women writers, Barry Adkid, arrived in USA from Polotsk as a young girl in the middle of 90s. And in her 1912 autobiography, characteristically titled The Promised Land, described the joy of rejection of her previous life, burdened by the stigma of inferiority, even while, while, even while still on the ship to America. All of these figures started their embrace of assimilation with a symbolic change of name. Objections against unconditional assimilation began to arise in the United States only in the third decade of the 20th century, paradoxically growing as Jews started to climb higher on the social and ethnic ladder. The concept of glorifying the charms of cultural pluralism, a concept competitive to unconditional assimilation was born in 1916 due to German-born sociologist and philosopher Horace Meyer Kallen. Kallen was the son of Silesian rabbi and a strong supporter of Zionism. For Kallen, the typical expectation that new Americans would quickly fully assimilate was not only unrealistic and even cruel, but also harmful for America itself. In his opinion, multi-ethnic states should provide for each of the groups the optimal conditions for the development of their culture. In place of one big melting, ala Zangir, he proposed the liberal version of the nation as a wealth of diversity. He compared such a nation to the symphonic orchestra, which resounds much better and louder than individual instruments on their own. In the 60s, the concept of multiculturalism and ethnic federalism was founded upon his long forgotten ideas. At the same time, the idea of the melting pot had to survive the crushing criticism from the Nathan Glasser and Patrick Moynihan. The authors of Beyond the Melting Pot used statistics to prove that this idea was just an ideological delusion. The point about the melting pot is but it didn't happen, they concluded. Jews had, as had Puerto Ricans or Irishmen, retained their original ethnic consciousness. So, is it possible that their grandfathers and parents were victims of collective hallucination? Or maybe that future leaders of no conservatism, leading authors of public interest or commentary, came to the conclusion that the less radical solution marked by the ambivalent assimilation of Jews in Central Europe proved the better solution. This talk tries to analyze the typical phenomenon accompanying the assimilation of Jews on Polish and American soil. Phenomenon observed through silent movies, sources which are very important, but rarely used by historians. There is naturally Another important reason to refer to the products of this new industry, the overrepresentation of Jews and people of Jewish origin among the producers who shape the ideological face of Hollywood. The Jewish component in undeveloped, undeveloped Polish cinema was, of course, much weaker. 
This entanglement of early moving pictures in the process of assimilation makes them a source of paramount value for the scholars. To begin, one should notice that Polish literature on assimilation of the followers of mosaic religion, compared to American literature on this topic, looks minor. Despite important studies by Arthur Eisenbach, Alexander Herz, Aina Sawa, and for a later period, period Irina Hurwitz Novakowska, many questions are still not worked out. For many reasons, Jewish assimilation of Central Eastern Europe proceeded slower and differently than in North America. Jews were here, speaking from Poland, part of the resident population, not an incoming group. In many places, they formed the big clusters, so we may not treat them as a diffused minority or people on the margins of society. Acculturation and integrational processes started in Poland on a mass scale in the middle of the 19th century and never stopped before 1939. Isaiah Berlin has compared them to the slow melting of a big glacier. Succeeding top layers melt, but the hard core stays intact. In the United States, everything was done during the lifespan of two generations, between approximately 1905 and 1950. As Samuel Goldwyn, born in Warsaw as Shmuel Gelfish in 1878 or 1882, joked, during one life we made a journey from Poland to Poloplay. In Poland, the situation accompanying assimilation was totally different because of the partitions of Polish territory. Modernizing Jews had to decide to whom to assimilate, to learning nations, Germans, Russians, Austrians, or to enslaved ones, Poles, Lithuanians. Most naturally preferred the first choice. Standing up for Polishness required, required a little bit of heroism. All this went on so after- Professor Grinberg, if yes. I may uh, stop you for one second. Yes. Uh, We've gotten uh, several uh, questions from uh, uh, people who are watching <clears throat> asking whether it would be possible for you to adjust your camera uh, uh -huh. so that we can see you. I saw, I guess I, what should I do? I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, maybe if you sat back or lifted uh, what you're reading up a little bit so that people could... Uh, Yes, I see that uh, I have just titled Jonathan Brandt, nothing more on my... Huh. Well, well, uh, what to do? So, oh, is it better? Well, yes, if you could keep this angle, this would be perfect. Okay. Because, uh, people want to see you as you are lecturing. Sorry, sorry, okay. Okay, very sorry. Uh, so, when I, uh, I stopped... Uh, Okay. Uh, if, uh -huh. Modernizing Jews had to decide to whom to assimilate, to ruling nations, Germans, Russians, Austrians, or to enslaved ones, Poles, Ruthenians. Most naturally preferred the first choice. Standing up for Polishness required a little bit of heroism. And all this went on after 1848, during a phase of increasing confrontation between the small nations integral nationalists. Among belated uh, Central Europe nationalism, Jewish nationalism was forming late and, like Lithuanian nationalism, strongly influenced by the romantic political thought of the Poles. In ethnically Polish territories, it developed only after 1905 and naturally greatly influenced the course and range of assimilation. Thanks to the camera lens, we are able to see some of the changes which are characteristic of that epoch. These views, caught by movies, deserve a moment of reflection. Early silent moving pictures, at least until to the time of David Work Griffiths, were dominated by documentary films, both in quality and in quantity. This type of moving pictures developed its own peculiar language of narration which was necessary to take up more complex subjects. Therefore, it is not a coincidence that viewers of that epoch 
derive their knowledge about the lives of other people from movies in the form of travelogues, travel reports, or actualités. Due to its universality, popularity, and availability for the people of different cultures and different cognitive competences, silent movies soon started to be an active force so shaping the social consciousness, informing about the world, they shaped the image of the same time, its image of the, at the same time. Movies not only strengthened or weakened existing myths and prejudices, but they also produced their own new ones. They created a new cultural code, readable at an latitude. So they facilitated, as Cohen showed in his work, the Americanization, modernization, and finally, assimilation of immigrants. In American documentaries, from the beginning of the 20th century, produced by Biograph, Edison, Callum, or Lubin, and as a rule, imitating the earlier achievements of the Brussels Lumiere film operators, the Jews, those who colonized the Holy Land, or those who arrived on Ellis Island, are the perfect embodiment of the stranger. They represent exoticism. It is their exoticism that makes them an interesting subject for the movie camera, which was continually looking for what would be attractive for the audience. Anti-Semitic stereotypes begin to appear on a larger scale in features around 1910. Until then, Europe, European, European Jews didn't arouse special interest. We should remember that contrary to the legend, the Jewish immigrants in America by no means occupied the lowest ranks of the social level. That place was reserved for the Chinese and more generally for Asians, treated commonly as the yellow peril, the greatest danger of the time. Compared with the force of anti-Chinese prejudice in popular culture at that time, anti-Semitism may be classified as marginal. Before the 20s, Jews were treated as Europeans and their advance was incomparably simpler than the advance of Asians who were condemned to live in a sort of ghettos. Only when Jews started to leave the Lower East Side of, on, on Manhattan on, and their Brooklyn communities, do we start to notice unfavorable changes in ethnic classification, immigration quotes, formal entry bans, and prohibitions of belonging. These changes move in tandem with anti-Semitic propaganda of Henry Ford and the activity of rejuvenated Ku Klux Klan. The removal of, of anti-Jewish barriers of this epoch in science, culture, sport, and the social life will be finished only in the 50s. Paradoxically, just that time, at that time, American Jews start to be eulogists of the success of integration. And in Hollywood, the main producers of the American dream. In contrast to the United States, in Poland, Jews were not exotic. Here they were not strangers, but others, a minority deeply entangled in all important Polish problems. It is probably not a matter of chance that despite this, or maybe because of this, pioneers of Polish cinema try persistently not to see them. To materialize as subjects which are attractive for the camera, they have to die first. All early Polish documentaries presenting Jews concern funerals. Urania from Lodz presented a reportage from the funeral of Maximilian Zilberstein. Okay. A well-known industrialist. It is uh, 70, October 16, 1907. A Stremer theater displayed the funeral of Epstein in Vilna, Ilya Epstein in Vilna, September 27, 1909. And Kinematograph Casino had in its repertoire the funeral of Chaim Elias Meisel from Lodz, May 4, 1912. Some, someone gifted with good eye, eyesight noticed representatives of the progressive synagogue laying wreaths at the statue of poet Adam Mickiewicz 
and died in Lvov on October 30, 1904. And that is all in about 500 documentaries before 1914. There's a chance that some Jewish snapshots were included in Lost Stands from Vilna Life by Kazimierz Proszynski, 1902. There were many so-called movies with views shot in Warsaw, Lvov, Vilna, or Lodz, but all of them do not feature presentation of Jewish quarter. Galician Kinematograph, a film made with great pomp in the summer of 1912 with the help of Pate under the high auspices of Countess Maria Lubomirska, created for a foreign audience, does not leave the impression that Jews live here. Also, by contrast, there are stands with dances of Highlanders or Hutul ceremonies. Such a procedure was in great contrast to the content of foreign movies, which abound in picturesque stands with Orthodox Polish Jews. Among the 40, 30 short movies prepared in 1902 on the streets of Vilna and Warsaw by Warwick operators, there is no less than 12 with Jewish subjects. In this film, however, there is no place for modernized, enlightened Jews. There is no Polish equivalent of the American movies which presenting life on the Lower East Side or seamstresses from Hester Street in New York. The lack of movies presenting the Jewish part in the revolution 1905-1907 may be explained by ubiquitous censorship and political conditions. One can read the statement that, as a muse for the Polish pioneers of the 20th century, the Jews from Palestine were much more interesting than those from Warsaw's Smalek. According to Nathan Gross, between 1910 and 1914, on behalf of Warsaw and Galicia, there were 10 movies made in Palestine for the Polish audience. It seems that such expensive productions with an exotic topic were much more profitable. Compared to the documentaries, the early primitive features allow us to capture more important details. First of all, they place the contemporary modernized view Jew in their field of view. For the authors of silent documentaries, such a Jew was almost imperceptible because he didn't stand out from the background. American features before 1919 can be divided into two separate groups. In the first, reluctant to portray Jews, or even disposed to portray them mockingly, the Jews aiming at social advance, advancement are presented as comic, sometimes even dangerous characters. Movies of the second group, sympathizing with Jews, treat their success as well-deserved deserved compensation for previously suffered wrongs in Europe. Glorifying Jews, they glorify America and the American way of life as well. Both types of feature films are aware of Jewish activity, but evaluate it differently. They also both feature the stereotyping of characters and insufficient internal differentiation of their portrayed environment. Realistic stories showing the difficulties of adaptation or hard living conditions are practically non-existent. Exemplary are natural film adaptations of Dankville works, with Melting Pot, 1916, among them. Typically, the success of Jews is preceded by dramatic compl com compl complications. In A Boy and the, and the Law, 1914, based on the authentic life of one William Eckstein, who plays himself, a boy threatened with arrest in Russia for belonging to secret organization runs away to Salt Lake City in Utah, where he lives with his uncle. Ignorant of obligatory rules, he comes into conflict with the law and is sentenced to compulsory re-education re in camp for youth on the farm. Elected by his peers as a mayor of the camp, he copes so well with his obligations that a couple years later we see him as the head of the project. A less lucky turn of events is depicted in Civilization's side by Charles Giblin. Berna, his heroine, runs away to New York after a pogrom by Cossacks in Kiev. There, she is a victim of unfinished courtship 
and vengeance from her employer. She loses her husband and the right to custody of her child and reacts by killing the former boss, who is a judge now. In Zulte Billet, the Yellow Passport, 1916, whose German version two years later is very well known to film historians as the international debut of Pola Negri. Sonia, the talented musician, or faint after the attack of black hundred people, Sonia Sonia, stays in the city and continues her still study. She has to take the so-called yellow passport, meaning she is prostitute. Persecuted by Ochrana, she has to leave Russia. In the United States, she makes a skyrocketing career as an opera diva. And when her past is disclosed, her friends from Russia come to the rescue, presenting evidence of her innocence. A similar formula is used in The Yellow Ticket, 1918, produced by studio Stadio Astra, with immigrant Fanny Ward as Anna Mirer, who gets a yellow ticket in order to visit her dying father in Petersburg. The only movie that breaks out of the pattern seems to be The Jewish Christmas, 1913, the early example of what would become typical for the next decade. We have here all the necessary ingredients. Intergeneration, intergenerational conflict between the not yet assimilated Rabbi Isaac and his American daughter, Leah, the marriage of Leah with a non-Jew, and Leah's father disowning her. In the end, we have naturally a tearful and eloquent scene, scene, scene of reconciliation on Christmas Eve. The rabbi sells his valuable prayer book to buy his daughter her longed-for wonderful Christmas tree. It symbolizes the accommodation of Jewish traditionalism to American reality. Movies critical of Jews typically present them as seemingly modernized, dressed modernly, and ostensibly faithful to American values, but in reality, cultivating the old bad habits and customs, and burdened by the old defects. Cohen, the hero of popular comic serial, is an individual sly, greedy, stingy, who is a ruthless towards the weak. She is an upstart, not aware of his ridiculousness. The hero of another comic serial is Sam Levy, Levitsky, whom we get to know as a pickpocket and prisoner. The special subgroup is formed by moving pictures which refer to true conflict of the time between Jews and Irishmen. Both national groups are depicted fighting for acceptance and a better position in multi-ethnic American society. They each displayed solidarity, an attachment to their respective religion, and a liking for the metropolitan environment. So they were doomed to rivalry. I would like to give here an example. There is such a famous uh, Irish song, Kathleen Mavurnin, Kathleen, my dear. Uh, and it was also presented in silent movies several times. In 1918, the heroine was played by Tida Bara, Jewish artist. And it was too much for the Irishman. There were protests outside of cinema halls, and also there were threatening of bombing the cinemas. And finally, the studio Fox had to withdraw the film from the repertoire because there was no other uh, possibility. And as a regards the Jewish uh, relation to, to, to Irishmen at that time, there was a jealousy of the position the Irish had in New York, in Polis, uh, in the, generally on the social level. And uh, if one wants to understand it, we are able to give you an example of a famous movie by... Um, uh, uh, oh yeah, the Gang of New York by Scorsese. It is 19th century, but in 20th of 20th century, there were also there were Jewish gangs, Italian gangs, and Irish gangs, and they were fighting each other. So it was still at that time very uh, hot battle. Now I return to. At the same time, in Polish territories, assimilation was hampered 
by deteriorating atmosphere of Polish Jewish relations. Relations deteriorated due to the prolonged Bailey's trial in Kiev with a ritual murder as accusation and because of anti-Jewish campaign of Endetia, National Democrats, who promoted the narrow concept of the Pole Catholic. Most Poles were also unprepared for the emergence of Jewish political nationalism. At the end of the Great War, there was a wave of pogroms in Eastern Galicia under the pretext of Jewish sympathy for the Bolsheviks. One can find very little of this analyzing synopsis of Polish Peter with Jewish character. Alexander Herz, close to banking circles, and at the same time a typical member of the polonized liberal intelligentsia of Jewish descent, also as a founder and boss of Studio Sphinx, supported patriotic content digestible for censorship and tried to avoid controversial topics. His mayor as a 1911, based on Eliza Orzeszkowa, does not include contemporary terms, sharpening the meaning of the original, it strongly opposes Jewish progressive and fanatical Orthodox members of the elders group. Similar are Jewish language movies from 1911-1913, a specific Polish phenomenon on the world sky. Productions of the studio Siwa by Mort Katowbin or of Cosmopin, Samuel Ginsburg, never bring up the actual controversial topic. They draw inspiration from 19th century Jewish playwrights and astonishingly present the point of view of those who live in the country. Even though the Jewish farmers were rather rare. The presented media are as a rule alienated from the Polish context. Interesting threads are perceptible in short 20 minutes long adaptation of Jacob Gordy's drama, God, Man and Devil, God, Man and Tybul, 1912. The pursuit of wealth proves to be here a mortal sin. We see the God-fearing Hersh, tempted by devil, buying lottery ticket. He wins and invests all the winnings in a toy, in a talis factory which is a death blow for the cottage worker. Finally, he commits suicide. In the cousin's doctor, the cantor's daughter, produced a year later and based on the Dalman Nibin play Broken Heart, we follow the drama of Gintelwer, a liberated woman with action that is centered in New York. The girl unknowingly gets wrapped up with a married man against the will of her parents. They have a child, and the family is only finally reconciled on her deathbed. The message of both works is unequivocal. Going beyond the frame of tradition, even with the best of intentions, leads to tragic consequences, namely here the death of the main character. The twenties, remembered in the United States as the age of death, were for Jewish immigrants a time of stabilization and of general improvement for their social image. At the same time, however, the negative side of the assimilation process began to appear. The quickly Americanized young generation was losing contact with their parents, insisting on living according to tradition. Families became less tight tonight, and the role of religious observance, observance dwindled. The situation of women changed particularly drastically. You can trace those changes in Hollywood production. The six biggest studios were governed by immigrants from Central Eastern Europe who understood the financial and entertainment potential of the tent news sooner than native-born Americans. They were witnessing the failures of their fathers who held on tightly to the old recipes for life. They left the Jewish ghettos on the western shore at a young age. They made fortune learning from mistakes. They tried to replace severe gaps in their education with careful observation of life of, in America. They arrived in Hollywood with a deep belief in success and with a good plan of action. 
quite soon they were breaking off contact with Jewish institutions and were reluctant to raise the risky ethnic topics in their movies. Despite efforts to be like normal wasps, they were still vulnerable to attacks and political pressures from the defenders of nativism. Patriotic contact was therefore obligatory. Such movies also characteristically contained moguls glorifying assimilation. Even though the count of mixed marriages among Jewish immigrants was at that time rather low, plots of Jewish movies, as a rule, featured marriage with a partner of different creeds. But this time it was not seen as a germ of tragedy. Optimists reigned. Movies registered the attainment of the next inaccessible foothold. Sports, the very important role of baseball, higher education, the elegant quarters of the city. Schemas of plot repeat themselves at now term. Rex Lurich's formula is well known. For instance, for instance in the Universal Cheated Love, 1921, whose heroine, Sonia, is played by Carmel Myers, Hollywood starlet and authentic daughter of Rabbi Isidore Myers, the pinnacle of success for a doctor coming from Russia is a marriage with marriage as a wealthy American heiress. Such typical success story shows deep divides in, the, in Jewish families, which were a source of sharp disagreement. In more ambitious screenings of journalistic texts, as well in novels of the third decade, one can find examples of conflicts determined by class, creed, or habit differences. Helpless immigrants are victims of Jewish scammers. Poor tailors are exploited by greedy and ruthless Jewish capitalists. Fathers lose authority in the eyes of their children, and children dare to oppose their fathers. All the traditional institutions are in crisis, and the old community breaks down irreversibly. Nothing of this can be seen in fairy tale Hollywood movies. There, the pinnacle of courage is to show that when a wealthy, loving son gives his parents an elegant house in suburbia, it makes them deeply unhappy, distracting from their wealth, distracting them from their wealth. Younger generation of Frank Capra, 1929. Often your schema is a rift between generations that distances the children from their parents. Many melodramas are based, are based on the separation of family by the ocean. Some movies, with an obligatory happy end, settle for presenting how new Americans overcome difficulties. Even jewish irish relations are presented more and more optimistic. It is not by chance that a more subtle and more detailed picture is contained in novels, in tales of Andrzej Jerska, Edna Ferber, or Fanny Hearst, there's a place for in-depth reflection on the consequences of assimilation as a thoughtful choice or on the need of accepting Americanization while preserving white identity. These tales and novels present very diverse attitudes for the latest wave of immigrants from Polish territory. Let's look, for instance, at Sid Goldin's film Ost and West, 1923, made in Austria. A wealthy New York Jew goes to Poland with his supermodern daughter, played by Molly Pisson, in shorts and boxing gloves, to be present at the marriage of his brother's eldest daughter. The journey back turns out a streak of blunders and cultural misunderstandings. This is the book, not a checkbook, he hears from his brother when he pretends to read prayer holding, holding the book improperly, opposite. The same Goldin makes a very interesting, made a very interesting adaptation of Sholem Ash, Uncle Moses, in 1932. In the, latest, in the latest publications of gender studies, there is a stress on topics which were not visible earlier, the victimization of women and the Zionist masculinization of Jewishness. In the famous jazz band singer by Alan Crossland, Warner Brothers, 1927, and especially in the minstrel performances of Al Jolson, a rabbi's son himself. Previously undiscussed racism 
and complexities have been raised. The Polish film industry of the 20s, both technically and artistically, was in no match for Hollywood, but, like the American film industry, it zealously supported assimilation and Polish-Jewish brotherhood. Historical exemplification of Jewish-Polish patriotism are presented in movies like Wamed Wolf and in Polish Woods, 1924, based on the Opatoshu novel, or Pantadeus, 1928. Movies made in Yiddish typically consolidated the image of the United States as a modern promise, promised land. The term of Judo Comuna, Jews as seedbeds of communism, exists only in the beginning of 20s, as in the film Grave Luck Secret of Edward Puchals. In this movie, the dangerous Rosa Whitein, head of the Bolshevik intelligence network, pretends to be Countess Chartonska. In Secret of Walewski Street, of Nalewski Street, 1921, an adaptation of Henrik Nagler's sensational novel, it presents the fight with prejudice with complicated Jewish engagement in modernization. We may risk the statement that due to considerable presence of Jews and people of the Jewish origin in pre-war Polish cinema, it was free of anti-Semitism, but unfortunately, it was theatrically stilted and thematically bound. Above all else, it does not present a realistic vision of the assimilated layers of Jewish society in the Second Polish Republic. The picture of assimilation is here much more fragmented. Thank you very much for your... Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Greenberg. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please register them in the Q&A function. Um, and before we get into audience questions, I have two questions for you, Professor Greenberg. Um, one is more of just... Um, administrative, a lot of people have asked if they can read your text afterwards. Would it be okay with you if we circulate um, the text of this talk? Yes, I would be happy to, if it was maybe published somewhere in the United States, I would be that happy. Okay, well, it, short of publishing it, at least we can circulate it for those um, who are here as a start. Um, so that's wonderful. And another question before we get into um, these other questions from the audience is, I'm curious, what brought you to this topic? Excuse, why, why I chose this topic? Yeah. Well, I was looking for something that would be interesting both for Poles, for Jews, for Americans, or every, everybody imaginable for me. So that is why I chose that topic. Okay, wonderful. Um, one, one of the questions in the audience Professor Greenberg, perhaps you could um, move back a little bit because we, we, I can't see all of you. I can only see the top of your head right now. Yeah, that's much better. If, could you stay there? Um, we have a question here about the portrayal of Jews in cinema today um, in Poland. Is that something that you could speak about at all? Well, now it's not a great problem because after 1968, a big group of artists of Jewish origin uh, emigrated from Poland. And uh, from that time on, there is very little to say about uh, this uh, Jewish presence in, among the in film industry or among film artists. On the, on the one hand, I can uh, think about, about persons who still live and are, are important. Um, how about the portrayal of Jews in cinema around the world today? Um, we see in America um, shows like Unorthodox and in Israel shows like Shtisel, the portrayal of Jews, it seems to be a very common uh, theme nowadays. Do you have any thoughts about this, the way Jews are portrayed in cinema outside of um, Poland? Well, if you ask if there is some special connection between Jewishness and film, uh, I don't know. Maybe there is something, because uh, as you have seen, but it, uh, it, it means that it's, uh, it's rather a problem of that entertainment industry uh, was waiting for someone to 
to, to, to do something to, to, to it. And those were the first to, to see the potential at that time. But uh, what, what is now, uh, is there a special uh, now connection between Jews and the movies? Maybe it's not visible in Poland. Uh, Israel is, of course, a Jewish country. But as regards America, yes, I know there are plenty of artists. But is there over-representation? I cannot say. I don't know. Um, one viewer now is asking about Polish films like Ida, Aftermath, and Demon. Are these films you're familiar with? Do you have any um, comments uh, about them? It's a, pro it's a problem of feeling the void, you know. Professor Greenberg, perhaps you could sit back a little bit. We're losing you. Yeah, uh, there, that's better. So thank no, you. The problem is the Jews left some void, some uh, vacuum. And uh, it's now it's more and more felt. Uh, so Polish artists try to show it. Uh, that, uh, that there's something is lacking in Polish culture, uh, in Polish understanding of their history without Jews and without this uh, important uh, presence of Jews, which was important before the Second World War. So that is why we have now movies like Ida uh, or other uh, subjects like this. I think it is a feeling that, that is, something is wrong without you. I say without Jews because there is a such a small percentage that is incomparable to the numbers before Second World War. Apropos of that, one viewer is asking, what is Jewish life today in Poland like? Uh, it's a little bit broader than this topic, but perhaps you could speak just a moment on it because it, it's kind of very relevant to what you just said. What is the situation dark of Jews now in, po in Poland? Well, it's not easy subject to, to tell into, into sentences now. Well, I think it's now a, a more normal time. I think there was a long time when Jewish subject or Jewish presence was, was not treated as normal. Uh, there were attacks or there were uh, silence about Jews. Now it is just a normal subject. So we live in normal time as regards this. Um, of course, there are anti-Semitic uh, political, individual political who tries to make uh, some gains on anti-Semitism, but it's not very, very important part of Polish politics now. Um, could you speak about the depiction of the Holocaust um, in films and uh, about the depiction of Polish-Jewish relations in film? Oh, you know, all of each of these questions is an individual problem to, to talk one day, you know, uh, like Holocaust or... Uh, well, I, I may say that uh, there are some dangerous changes in Polish political life that um, are really difficult to swallow, like uh, um, nominations of people of very, very far uh, right views on some important uh, offices or some, uh, well, even the governing party from time to time uh, makes some not acceptable uh, comments. There is a fight against historians who tries to present Polish history critically. It doesn't, it's not a problem just of Jewish or presentation of Jews, but general problem, are we to present Polish history as like Jews? also in Israel, especially try as innocent victims of everybody from abroad. Or we look like more seriously and treat Poles like other nations which have very good and very bad pages in the history. So it's not a 
specific problem of relation to truth, but a problem of bad understood uh, nationalism, uh, which or they presented as patriotism, but it's for me it's not a patriotism. It's uh, it's negative, very negative uh, understanding of um, of nationalism. Does this um, reflect in any way in the Polish government's views or actions in relationship to Jewish culture, um, you know, particularly cinema, but in anything else uh, today? Or is it more just this political issue about Holocaust scholarship? Uh, to Jewish culture formally is better and better because there is more and more institutions uh, that are, have to do something with Jewish history, Jewish culture. But I'm not. I'm not sure is it better or not because uh, I think it was rather because we have now new new museums, uh, new programs, and so on and so on. But I think that they are sometimes rather to fight the Jewish Historical Institute or independent Jewish institution from the governmental side than to um, help. Uh, and and um, best to, to better uh, situation. Uh, I think some of these new institutions are not doing uh, well, good good work. Um, here's a lighter question from someone in our audience. For over a quarter century, from around 1930 to 1960, many non-Jewish New Yorkers followed the show The Gre The Goldbergs. Um, about a fictional Jewish household, which was serialized as a radio soap opera and later as a TV show and in cinema. And this questioner asks, were the Goldbergs known in Europe, perhaps? Or were they ever shown there? And if so, um, do you have a sense of what their reaction to them was? Well, uh, could you repeat? Because I didn't understand something. Uh... There was a show called The Goldbergs. I never seen this, so okay. I can... I cannot say anything about it. Very well. Okay, so I think, Professor Greenberg, unless you have any final comments, maybe that's a good place to end. Thanks very much. If, if it's all, so I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it was a pleasure having you here at YIVO. And um, thank you all to, to those who joined. We will circulate um, the text of this talk in an email following up, as many requested. I, I, I have already given to Professor Weiser yes. the text of this. So you can use it however you use it. OK, wonderful. I would, I, would be, I would be happy if there was a possibility to publish it somehow. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Greenberg. Thank you. And thank you so much to everyone that joined. Please. Um, may, do make sure to follow YIVO in all the usual places on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. And we hope that you'll join us again for other public programs. Um, we've got a really wonderful lineup, which you can check out at yivo.org slash events. Um, and yeah, we'd love to see you again soon.